Hello, and welcome to Creative by Constantine, where we give you life hacks from music's best. Like and subscribe so that you know when our next episodes are out. And now it gives me tremendous pleasure to introduce my friend, Soyan Kate Lee. Soyan went to Juilliard with me, and she won some of the top competitions in the world, including Walter Naumberg, Concert Artist Guild, Santander, and Cleveland Piano Competition and is a renowned teacher and recording artist who has a ca contract with Naxos label. And we're going to talk about life as a teacher, recording artist, and an administrator because she also co-founded Music by the Glass, a remarkable chamber music series. Sian, welcome. Thank you, Constantine. It's so nice to see you. Great to see you too. Yeah. Despite the I, <laughs> exactly. So we're seeing each other in the virtuality. Yes. So yeah, I like to begin in the uh, at the beginning, which is, do you remember the moment when you knew you were going to be a professional pianist? Oh, I thought you were going to ask. Do you remember the moment when I met you for the first time? Which <laughs> I do. Um, <laughs> we'll get to that later. <laughs> when I um, knew I was going to be, actually, no, I I didn't have one of those epiphanies, and. Um, I started seriously rather late, meaning I didn't own a piano at home until after Juilliard. And um, I would go home in the summer and my parents kind of thought, oh, you might need an instrument now. So we, we decided to get one. So I started really by chance. Um, everybody learns piano in Korea. It's sort of the thing to do in the neighborhood. I didn't have any fancy teachers or anything. I went to somebody who lived next to me. Um, but sort of the turning point was I moved to West Virginia because my dad was doing research when I was nine and I had absolutely no friends because I didn't speak English and people thought I looked weird and, you know, because there were very few Asians at the time. Um, and so my parents would drop me off at the Creative Arts Center, um, which is called this CAC in um, WVU, so that I could just do it all on the piano because I had played some back in Korea. And so one day I'm playing there by myself and this Romanian lady with really cool boots um, knocked on my door and said, honey, what are you doing? Where are your parents? Are you practicing? Um, what are you practicing? And I said, you know, I, um, I'm just doodling at the piano. I don't really have a teacher. I have no friends. <laughs> and so that's why I'm here. And she thought it was really sweet because she still remembers. And she decided, well, you know, I teach piano. Do you, do you want me to teach you? And her name is Marina um, Schmidt. And she's basically um, the first person to have seriously decided to teach me and um, sort of instilled the love of music. And I really loved her boots. And I thought, you know what, you're the lady for me. I, th I, I think we're gonna go. And you know, she would make me my dresses for recitals. And so, so it oh started with her and she still sends me boxes of uh, clothes for Ella and Noah every month without fail. Um, Amazing, she sounds yeah. like a, a fairy godmother from Cinderella. She's <laughs> really, she's a sweetheart, yeah. And so that's how it started. And um, my parents were going back to Korea and I could either go back with them or go to Interlochen Arts Academy in Michigan, um, which is such an amazing place. And so we made the difficult decision because I'm so close to my family, you know, we made the difficult decision for me to go to Interlochen. And I think that probably changed or changed the direction of my life to really focus more on music. Um, but I remember even when um, we were at Juilliard, I sometimes felt foreign to these other friends that we had who were so driven from a very, very early age, you know. Um, and so I, I came to it, I think, a little bit differently. And it sort of seeped in. I think my love for music really seeped in. And it was kind of, it was kind of like wine, you know, it, and it's still maturing 
And I, I love that. I feel like I'm peeling something and getting into it deeper and deeper. Yeah. So. Well, I think it's very organic. What you're describing is a very organic self-realization and self-actualization as a musician. Because I feel that a lot of, a lot of us among our colleagues are preconditioned by the family to yeah. do it. Whether they follow in the footsteps of family members or not. I mean, I, I have friends, and I'm sure you do too, whose parents aren't musicians, but they were so excited by the idea of a wunderkind right. that they went out of their way to sort of be stage parents and push them, push them, push them. Right, right. And, you know, sometimes it works, but not always. And I think what you're describing is a beautiful way of just kind of becoming. Yeah, I mean, and I didn't do it obviously by myself. You, I feel yeah. incredibly lucky because I feel like everybody, starting with Marina, but everybody that I met along this musical journey, and that includes teachers, of course, because that's in a, in a way the most influential, um, but people and friends that I've become close to, and of course my family who just sort of stayed the course with me and supported yeah. me, you know, things don't always line up even if you want it to and i just feel very blessed that i've had the right people you know turn up in my yeah. life at the right time so yeah that, well that makes perfect sense what was the experience of interlocking like interlocking was awesome it was <laughs> it was really crazy um my roommate i i had several um, really close friends there. One of them, I think you met her, Jessica Soralski, yeah. who is on the board of Music by the Glass that I run. Um, my best friend and roommate, her name was Maggie Hall. She went on to um, Harvard and Northwestern Business and she she was work, working with Google and she's incredible. She has four children and oh she's just, you know, such a go-getter and a positive spirit. And I just feel like Interlochen, you know, it's a renowned art school. But academics were really strong there too. You know, my, my roommate was an academic major. And um, so I feel like I was surrounded by these brilliant minds. And, you know, it was kind of amazing to just have a family away from home, you know, and to be just surrounded by music, ballet, art, poetry, all of that, um, and nature. It's so beautiful there. Yeah, because it's sequestered and almost in a forest. Yeah, it, it, you're just in a, it, it's like quarantine. <laughs> you're in but a nice one. With a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I just remember, oh, we ate so much because the cafeteria had this frozen yogurt machine and you could go get as many, you know, cones as you like. And I remember stuffing my coat with all the bagels from the bagel jar so that I could eat it until lunch. And I, I just remember I, I ate so much that, so, uh, that, that year, my freshman year there, my, actually my sophomore year, um, that I went back, my parents picked me up from the airport and they were like, do you need a, do you think you might want to go to the gym? <laughs> Summer walk, <laughs> and they said it so nicely, but it was kind of like, oh yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah. It was well. Fun. You don't have to worry about that as as the time. No, shows. no, it was a fantastic place. You you're just yeah. You know, it, and how was the transition from there to Juilliard? Um, well, a little difficult at first because I went from the middle of the trees, basically in the middle of nowhere um, by the lake to right in the middle of New York City, you know, and it could not be more different just in terms of environment. Um, luckily, my roommate was um, somebody who had been a dance major at Interlochen. So I knew, I, I knew some people, but, you know, I, the warm, fuzzy vibe of all my friends was gone and I felt like I had to start all over and um, I don't know it was it was definitely a transition you know but I loved the studio that I was in Mr. Lowenthal because he he sort of made his students in the studio all feel like it was one big family you know yeah. with all those Thursday yeah. Chinese dinners and everything You're right yeah so yeah you know I, I think it, it was, was mostly going from um, such a quiet place in nature to the middle of the city 
you know, when you're 18, you yeah. can feel really lost. And it's not like you have that much money. And so you're <laughs> you know. Look, I remember the first two years of my being at Juilliard and living in the dorms. I haven't even left Lincoln Center. I mean, going downtown meant walking down to 59th Street. That's exactly what I, I ended there. Unless you want to Carnegie, of course, then you go a few more blocks, but then you come But right that's back. like traveling. <laughs> yeah, that's traveling. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah is and of course, I remember how we met in Santa Barbara, California, summer of 99, Music Academy of the West. That's right. It's just it's so incredible that at the moment I saw you, I didn't even, I mean, I actually heard about this great pianist, Ryan Kate Lee, uh, but I didn't know that it was you. It was, we were so before social media, I couldn't have you know, Facebook stalked you in advance. So I really had no idea what any of my colleagues would look like. Oh, and there you were, so kind and, and warm. And I, you know, I came straight from Russia. Yes, I was on a plane from Moscow. Suit. You landed in your white suit. In my white suit and hat. <laughs> I know, I looked like a pimp from the 30s. Oh it, it was really, you know, and I didn't know what to make of you. At first, I thought, who is this guy? Although, you know, Constantine, we were in a competition together four, I think three or four years before that, the, yeah. the junior Tchaikovsky. But oh, you yes. probably don't remember me because I got knocked out so early. Oh, so have I. Oh, well, <laughs> I remember so many people from there, but I, um, I don't think we... I don't know, maybe we weren't forced into a breakfast mm -hmm. together, um, but I knew you were there. And so I was actually really excited to meet you and see you, of course. Oh, that's so yeah. wonderful. You know, but that was Senda. You know, that was the first time in my entire life when I traveled somewhere without being chaperoned by my mother. I, you, I you was 15. One of the, the youngest ones to do that. Yeah, that and was, I was 15. Was and my parents have sort of, you know, put me on a plane in Moscow, but then I was left to my own devices. And I mean, I didn't get in trouble. I didn't get lost. I didn't, you know, misbehave. But it was, I felt that I was the king of the world because I didn't have, for the first time in my life, I was in strange new place, you know, yeah. Japan, yeah. at a competition. And I was completely by myself and on my own. Oh, I, I wish we had... Met. I know. I wish we had really met then because I think I was also overwhelmed with the newness of all this. And I didn't really, um, I, I didn't really connect with people. I connected with the place. I mean, I went on endless walks and explorations whenever I wasn't practicing. I was just meandering Sendai. Now that I think about it, I think that was dangerous and pretty dumb. <laughs> uh, but, but that's what I did. I didn't like hang with anyone you know yeah, I just yeah. went on these explorations but that's so remarkable and of course then for, but we have been together closest friends since the moment we met but Perfect. through so many of the competitions that we did together and and I will never stop talking about it because I felt it was such a, a defining moment of what being a musician and a colleague is in our world is that the humanity of it uh, was in a center. It all. It it was never a competition, bit among you and I. It was never, um, you know, we, we weren't aware of the fact that that someone was judging us against each other. We were just two friends who who love playing the piano and who are there to support and help each other. And I thought the the, the beautiful culmination of it, of course, was that. Cleveland Piano Competition Finals, that was the first time that, that a remarkable orchestra agreed to play the finals for the competitions. We were sort of their <laughs> guinea pigs. We were the yeah, trial yeah, round. The first, you know, green contestants that got to play with this amazing symphony. And it was an important event. Um, and I remember how beautifully you played. And I was so moved that, you know, you went to my rehearsal and well, and heard yeah, I, me too. I thought you were so sweet because my rehearsal was so late and you had to play the next day and you still stayed up to come listen to the rehearsal and tell me about the balance and everything. And I, I thought it was just so sweet of you. I, 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 remember, <laughs> I remember. But that's, that's what we do. And oh, you know what I found the other day? I found the CDs, the winner CDs from that year. Oh, no. Would you like one? I can mail it to you. <laughs> do I want I, one? I, okay. All right. I, I literally Not have a dozen. Uh, I have a dozen. I was <laughs> shocked. I was apparently hoarding our CDs because oh, I opened the I box and there they were. A whole bunch of them. Oh, wow. 
a, pro a Cleveland piano competition to release them, and we're all there standing there holding hands, taking a bow together as prize winners. Oh, yeah, it's so, so, it's really moving to see it now. You know, I'm glad I hoarded them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, you, of course, done so incredibly well, and your career would have happened even without competitions, I'm sure. But it was a help, wasn't it, in the beginning? <laughs> Uh, and now, as an educator and as a j member of many juries of, of these competitions, what do you feel uh, has changed from the times that you were a contestant to uh, the kind of a situation contestants are today? Hmm. I think the first thing that has changed um, is the virtual aspect of it. So... Uh, I mean, even smaller competitions are live streamed these days, right? And everything is recorded, then everything is disseminated. And, um, you know, I think there are pros and cons to that. You know, um, I think the other thing that has changed, I, I don't know about changed, but, you know, I think there were always a lot of competitions. I mean, when, when we were there, of course, there were much fewer during our teachers. Um, competition times but um, I think that one has to also be careful of which ones you choose to do you know I think there are competitions that are very helpful and necessary um, I'm not going to name which ones but I, I also think there are competitions that maybe you don't necessarily need to put yourself into you know um, it's definitely gotten in a way more difficult to get into them. I don't know if that comes from just the sheer number of pianists or that, you know, it feels like maybe that is maybe sometimes the only way for a budding pianist to get their foot in the door. Um, whereas maybe before it would have been managers or, I, I know that still happens, but lot right. of fewer cases, you know, um, right. or auditions that you would play for conductors. Um, so I don't know, you know, I think competitions are wonderful because it makes you push yourself, right? I mean, yeah. it was for me. Oh, and absolutely. It, it, it also prepares you for a career very specifically, I, I, I noticed this, you know, when we were applying for these competitions and you have to have rounds and rounds of repertoire and you think, oh my gosh, you, one day you practice the first round and then it feels like the next day you forgot all about the concertos, you know, it, it, it's very hard to balance. And I think that is a really good lesson in real life because you're juggling so many things. Once you leave the orbit of, I'm a piano student, and I have weekly lessons and I do this and I, this is for my boards or juries or whatever it is. And you're thrust into this, you're gonna play concerts or you're gonna have these recording projects or you're gonna to have to do this and this chamber music festival. Then all of this repertoire is thrown at you. And so if you haven't learned how to juggle that amount of repertoire, I think it's difficult. So in that sense, it's really good preparation. You know, everybody yeah. says also it's exposure, which it is. Yeah. Um, I sometimes feel for negative exposure aspect of it too, because people are always growing, you know, and sometimes I look at things from 10 years ago and I think, oh God, and could somebody please take that down? Or, you know, it's like looking at photos of ourselves from a long time ago and the clothes are just off, you know, or the hair is not working. And, and I think that, you know, it's interesting in a way, but it can also be not as forgiving. So I, um, I think that may be difficult, more difficult. I don't know. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that, look, when I look back at, you know, my competition career, um, I was never live on air. Some of it was taped, right. but it was taped either for archival purposes or if it were to release, I would sign the release. Right. And so in other words, I would sort of bless it. And uh, I mean, thankfully, I mean, I never really embarrassed myself enough to not sign it. But, you know, I mean, obviously you feel a little better and worse about some, but, but now it really is, you are, um, whether or not you want to yeah. uh, on, on camera. And 
generally it may have um it could have a positive effect in terms of if people prepare in advance and they're really ready it can sort of be great exercise and sort of performance under pressure right. but if someone is slightly underprepared is uh, a sensitive soul and experiences it can be a great source of anxiety because you really feel that you're being stripped bare in front of people mm -hmm. Yeah. And I see both, you know, I see people who do remarkably well knowing that they're being streamed in close ups of course. and people who just freak out yes. and, and they can't just sort of think about the music because they're worried about that they're going to drool in the middle of a piece. You know, mm -hmm. let's face it, not everyone is in control of their body. I mean, it takes us a lifetime. I mean, you know, it took me into my 30s to stop biting my lower lip when I play <laughs> sometimes. No, really. And my dad always says, stop doing it. It makes you look like you're, you know. Uh, ch have challenges and and I, and I <laughs> because whenever I would have a real difficult passage I would go and I wouldn't even realize I'm doing it I didn't until know. I, I really sort of became aware of it and then I got it out you know my system by developing a whole system of facial control and so if I need to go to a base facial uh, lock in in a difficult moment I just suck in my cheek cheeks you know I go because it looks good Right, so I know, okay, so if I'm going to do something that is unnatural, it's yeah. better photograph well, right? Because we're filmed whether or not we want to. But, you know, it's much easier to do when you're not doing it, when, when you're doing it as an adult and, you know, with a grain of salt and a sense of humor, <laughs> as yeah. opposed to when you're 21 and you think, you know, the whole world is watching and then you're shot from a bad angle and you just feel <laughs> devastated, you know. Yeah, that's true. And, and part of that maybe, I guess, is like you just said that sometimes it's a negative experience, sometimes it's a positive experience. Some people freak out, some people don't. And I think it comes down to really knowing yourself, right? Knowing what your own tendencies yeah. are, figuring out what works for you. I mean, it's the same thing with a exercise regime, a diet, what you wear, you know, we don't all have perfect bodies, but we somehow manage to make it look like one with clothes or, you, you know, I mean, yeah. but I think, you know, I, I know I'm making sort of light of this, but I think that's true in music business too. There are certain people who, um, like you just mentioned sensitive souls who can produce amazing music and moments of sheer beauty that you know somebody yeah. with like a you know, nerves of steel can just go or just perform the way they did in the practice room maybe wouldn't have those amazing moments and so maybe for that person you know there's so many different kinds of competitions also of so i think you have to be just a little bit more judicious about which ones you choose to do um yes you know just knowing yourself and knowing what kind of repertoire suits you no, that's that, look those are all great advices mitigated risks right <laughs> now but how do you mitigate anxiety you know i think all of us are prone to it there's nobody who could honestly say i have absolutely no stage fright i have no anxiety i just sort of live as naturally on stage as off um when you feel a certain amount of that anxiety how do you deal with it well my anxiety type of anxiety that I have, I think has changed. Um, I still have them, but they've taken a different form. And, you know, I think when I was, even, even for competition, you know, when you're young, you don't worry about memory at all, right? Like you don't even, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you, you don't think about that at all. And then there was a point in my, uh, like during certain competitions where that becomes more of a thing that you think about and you're much more aware of then at some point it's, well, am I playing too many wrong notes? And then it goes into some other things. Um, honestly, I think their anxiety is good, right? Just like certain levels of stress is also good too. Um, in a weird way, what has been really helpful for me to take myself out of the picture, because I think anxiety comes from the stress of proving yourself in a way right? And in a competition that's proving yourself so you can play as best as you can and you can get to the next round and all of these things. When you leave that competition orbit, it's kind of like trying to prove yourself to the audience, to the critics, 
to a conductor, to the orchestra, to your fellow chamber musicians. And I think that is a beautiful that, that thing that comes with aging and maturing, I suppose, is that the need to prove yourself becomes a little bit more diluted. And, and the fastest way to do that is to have children because you're just so, I mean, for me, I, I, I know it sounds silly, but I really, now that I have two little ones, I don't really have that much time to think about myself to that degree where I am freaking out about what well, am I going to impress this person? Because I'm really impressed at myself if I get through the day and I get three hours of practice in and I'm concentrating really well. I'm really happy yeah. <laughs> about that. So in that sense, I, I don't know. I'm sure, it, look, it's not like I'm saying you have to have children to do that. But personally, no, for me, it is the only thing that has forced me to think outside of myself. I guess I was a real you know, narcissist before, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, look, no, what you're saying is so poignant and beautiful because we do have to real, I think th that a lot of the, the, the typical anxieties that we have that are all about how will people perceive us mm -hmm. uh, fall away as we're beginning to see larger picture and having children is, is, is probably the biggest larger picture that there is. You know, one can just, see that's if you're that's next year, that's your flesh and blood that's your future um but in general even if one doesn't have children just thinking about a bigger picture about sort of life as a as a, as a continuum that lasts uh, a lifetime that, you know, no no, no i completely yeah. understand um, by so then then whatever happens tonight at 7 30 becomes somewhat less important you're uh, exactly right and you know and my the continuum thing is right on point. It's just, it's yeah. a journey and you're on part of it. Yeah. Know? And those are just steps. And, you know, of course, as you know, you know, I, I do believe in, you know, the, 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 there, there are ways, there are tools and systems such as narrative musicianship, which, you know, you can create story, you can use your fear and anxiety in a productive way. But long before I conceptualized uh, all of that and sort of realized that there, there's a way to really, use it and harness it and just organize it into a manageable situation. I used to read the, um, the, inter the, the front pages of international sections of newspapers that always tell you of disasters all over the world. <laughs> and, um, you know, there's, an, there's a typhoon here and there's, you know, an explosion, the coal mine there. And there's, a, and then you realize that the whole fear of what will the critics say and that everybody will just love you becomes so ridiculous and feeble, right? That it helped me, literally. Actually, we were on the fifth floor of Juilliard and silly me, I was freaking out about, I think playing in studio class and you told me that exact thing. You're like, Everything. we're not fighting a war. <laughs> I remember that. I remember thinking oh my God. that. <laughs> right <laughs> yeah but you know and so i remember so that was long before i sort of took intellectual approach to all this say, well how can we use this um you know i would flip through the newspaper backstage and people would say are you this just detached and uninterested in music that you're reading newspaper before you go on and it was really my tool of getting myself to calm down and to stop freaking out yeah it's very easy that. accessible silly thing to do but I think the intellectualization of all of this that you've done with your narrative, I think is pretty convincing. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I believe in it, but this is something that requires time and effort. You know, this is not as easy as picking up USA Today and reading the front page. Right. You know, this is something that requires some work to really, uh, with yourself, to understand yourself and to learn how to then use all these emotions in a very productive way. Yeah. But the simplest shortcut is a life hack using our tagline. <laughs> Just read the front page of any of the papers because they always, you know, they say in the news, if it bleeds, it leads. They always have the worst stories on the front page. <laughs> and, and then we, all of a sudden, to me, we immediately feel happy, warm, and fuzzy sitting backstage in a beautiful gown or a tuxedo about to play some beautiful music, right? So we feel fortunate to be there and yeah. not to be in those news articles. Yeah. Um,
Now, I mean, speaking of having children, uh, you just amaze me how you managed to do so much and, and combine it with, of course, being a mom. And what does it feel like to have a performing career and a teaching career? And of course, music by the glass, all of which requires time. But then you have something that overrides all of those requirements for two children. Um, the honest truth answer is that it's really, really challenging. <laughs> and it's, um, I have to work very hard to keep it together. And I mean that, I mean that very honestly in terms of just keeping it together so that I don't, you know, drop any balls on projects that I have or don't learn my repertoire that I need to learn, but it just to psychologically keep it together so that I don't break, you know, um, and because it's so exhausting, I think it's just physically so exhausting that sometimes I, I practice and I think, am I, how long is it going to actually take me to memorize this? Because I'm not sure if my, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. I feel like it's the ball that comes on up on the Mac screen. Yeah. yeah, so. oh, yeah. <laughs> the one we all hate because uh, it means yeah. you're going to sit there for a few minutes. Yeah. But so I don't know, you know, I think there is definitely a part of me um, that feels like, you know what? I can't have it all, just like I can't have it all as a musician um, or as a pianist. I sometimes sit there and try to play something, you know, some pieces that I would love to be able to play so well that I, I'm not able to, for whatever shortcomings I have as a pianist. Um, and that you accept, you know, we can't, we can't have it all. And that's part of accepting who you are and knowing who you are, right? And I think that has to go into every part of it. I'm not gonna be a perfect teacher for everyone. You know, I'm not gonna be the favorite pianist of everyone. And I'm not going to be a perfect mother, but you know, you kind of just allow yourself to do the best you can, you know, and to be okay with messing up and fixing it, you know? And yeah, judging well, yourself a little less, I guess. Uh, from outsider observation, I can't really imagine you messing up, uh, particularly on being a mother, because I've seen you just succeed with that beautifully and, and really uh, seemingly manage it with such poise. You know, I understand that it takes a great deal of willpower to project the, this degree of poise and, <laughs> you know, zen, uh, but you definitely do that very beautifully. But, you know, I think you're, to me, an embodiment of argument uh, for uh, women in the profession, if they want and feel ready to have children, uh, they absolutely, you can have a meaningful career and you can be a mother because, you know, particularly in Russia, uh, where I come from, there is a certain sense, um, it's, it's a bit old fashioned, but it's still prevalent, actually, shockingly. Uh, there are a few who, uh, ladies who defy that, um, but they say, you know, you have to choose. It's either, you know, career um, in me a real meaningful life in music or, or sort of motherhood, but, you know, it's kind of impossible to do both. Uh, few have done amazingly well, Olga Kern, for instance, and, and you yourself, twice over. <laughs> yeah, but then I get, you know, I, I think it was Michelle Obama's go, you can't, you can do everything, but just not at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to prioritize. But I think that's true. Even, I mean, you don't have to have children for it. It's just the time of your life. It's different. You know, when you leave school and all of a sudden you have to support yourself, um, practicing all different kinds of things, it, it takes on a different priority. It depends on what you have to do to get through the day the next day. Do, do you know what I yeah, mean? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, pivoting completely to something else, um, I still remember today this remarkable concert at Carnegie Hall um, uh, where uh, at Zankel, when you wore a very special couture gown. Yes. Um, <laughs> what did it feel like? Because it looked beautiful. It was <laughs> really, really heavy and I could barely breathe. Um, 
And it, and was, it was made out of? Juice pouches, 6,000 juice pouches, wow. which um, was my, my way of bringing some environmental awareness, um, which I still very much feel we should promote. Um, Absolutely. And I try to do, you know, I, I try to read actually books about recycling and trash to Noah yeah. um, every week so that we can try to use less. I'm, I'm very guilty of not doing enough, but I, I, anyway, yeah. So that's that, was, well, I, yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, no. No, 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 that concert was a lot of fun. Yeah. The dress was just a, a symbol of yes. just, just a reminder, you know. Yeah, but it was something very, you know, you don't see that very often. And it was just, again, it was a wonderful experience. And I felt wonderful to be there and, and to see a place so beautifully uh, wearing something that I knew couldn't possibly have been very comfortable. <laughs> uh, but so since we're talking about that, you know, you have such timeless style. Uh, and clearly, I think it's beyond um, doubt that the certain degree of personal style is very important in, in our world, that it is uh, music, while, of course, sounds come first, is concert-going experience, is somewhat visual. And, and today, people are really having a, a ball with, with all sorts of degrees of uh, dress or dress up. And where do you stand on that? How do you feel about the personal style, its importance and forms of its expression? I think, hmm, what do I think about, let, let me just clarify your question. So what do I think about the role of, of our dresses and tuxedos in how the concert itself is perceived? If there yeah. is a role that's involved? Right. I think there is definitely something that, people define you by, you know? I think it's easy, if, for example, if you're a pianist who doesn't wear shoes on stage, I think that's memorable to some degree, just, just because, you know, there's so many pianists <laughs> that um, mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying it's a gimmick, but I, I just, it's whatever you feel comfortable in. Yeah. Um, and some people feel very comfortable going all out, being extremely glamorous, where do I fit? I mean, I do think that the minute you set foot on the stage, you're performing. It, um, that's before you sit down. I do agree with you in that regard. Um, I don't feel that it has to be necessarily something flamboyant, but that you're not, you're not playing in your living room, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. And so I think that is something that we do for the respect to the audience, really, but people who bought tickets and got dressed up themselves to show up to your concert. So I think it's in that sense, it's, it is part of the entire experience. Where do I fit in it? I, um, I, I like to be comfortable. Um, I'd rather be comfortable than like really beautiful. <laughs> Do you, do you know what I mean? Um, I know, of course. And, uh, let's see. And I like simple things. I, I, I like dresses or clothes that are just simple, but elegant. Elegant, but simple. Yeah. Well, that's exactly what you, you look just timelessly elegant. Um, I guess why I was asking is, you know, I, have you ever dressed for a specific piece of music? Like if you were, when you were soloing with a orchestra and a piano concerto, have you ever felt that there was a particular type of address that was more, you know, reflective of the music you were playing, or is it really Oh, not that's interesting. Reflective? No, I think there was a time when I did think about that. You know, I, I always thought, Rachmaninoff, I should wear red. I, I don't know why. Or Mozart, not red. Maybe something teal or, you know, I, I do right. remember thinking about it in that way. Um, I don't so much anymore. And I, again, I don't know why that is. It's kind of like people choosing to do different things with their hair. I mean, it's, it's not because one is better. <laughs> it's just you kind of go through stages, I think, you know. But I, um, you know, I know there is a movement towards being more casual, you know. And I think that's also appropriate in wherever you're playing. You know, I think to come out very casually in a 6,000 seat theater, might not look appropriate or fitting, I, I should say. Um, but I think if you play an alternative venue 
or very intimate and um and then it's okay to be casual do you know what i mean it would be of strange course. to go in a ballroom gown so right no of course no it's very interesting it's just so interesting even to talk about because i didn't think we get to articulate those things very much I, uh, I agree that as time passes, I, comfort is actually the number one uh, thing that I think about, contrary to what it may look, because there, there are many very <laughs> interesting and glamorous ways of, you know, in, in athleisure, in, in comfort clothes. So you can still look sort of special, uh, but comfort is very important to me. I used to suffer through terribly uncomfortable pants or bad shirts and things, <laughs> you know, just because they, I thought they looked good and now I just won't wear them, you know. Or shoes for women. I, or mean, sh heels. Yeah. I mean, you have to be able to pedal comfortably, you know. Yeah, so I, I can't it, go above a certain heel to actually also yeah. walk on stage with some kind of confidence, you know, and not feel right. like I'm going to fall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but, and so, it, that, but that's all very, that's a wonderful message to young pianists out there that you know there is a certain sense of decorum and a, a fittedness to to the event but there is no strict dress code no one has to wear a tuxedo or a ball gown but they needn't walk out on stage in khakis and button downs either no mm -hmm. <laughs> then there is um what i wanted completely pivoting away from that uh your remarkable recordings I didn't choose your project because you recorded Scriabin, two CDs, am I correct? And you have a Scarlatti CD right now um, and, and many more. What draws you to the project? Is it something you bring to the label? Does the label bring it to you? Um, well, Naxos um, has a complete catalog or their, their, their idea is to have a complete catalog of music in general, not just piano music. And so when I won Concert Artist Guild, one of the prizes that they negotiated for me was a recording with Nexus. And that was my first Scarlatti CD. At that time, I don't really know how it happened, but um, I ended up choosing Scarlatti Sonatas. And there were obviously many to choose from. Many had been done before, but there were plenty left. And I tried to stay away from you know, the famous ones, two or too many famous ones anyways. Um, but then, you know, Naxos is always, it, it, they have a very comprehensive recording um, already catalog. And so when it came time to do more projects, they would send me a list of the things that either they would like to re-record because it has been a while or things that have not been recorded before. Surprisingly, the early Scriabin works had really not been recorded. And I'm, I'm so happy that I got to know them because, you know, Scriabin often gets, early Scriabin, um, it gets this, has a reputation of just being a Russian Chopin, right? Which, yes, he was influenced, but he clearly has his own voice right from the beginning. You know, that his use of left hand, his use of rhythm um, is, I think distinctly his own, even when, you know, the genres of mazurka and impromptus might be, you know, inspired by Chopin. So I, um, it was really eye-opening to get to know those pieces. Then I did another, oh, I did something that's totally unlike me in a way, that the list transcriptions. By the way, I was reading and practicing this week the Tristan and Isolde, and I couldn't stop thinking about you because you play that so beautifully. Um, Thank you. And then I did another album of Scarlatti, and those were even more um, sort of off the beaten track than the first one. And with Ella, when I was pregnant with her, I recorded the early, early Clementi sonatas, and that was my last one. So everything that I've recorded for them has been things that, you know, are sort of in the margins of the repertoire. And it gave me, it, you know, it gave me a certain confidence actually to record those because if you're trying to record the list sonata, I mean, you're, what do you have to bring to it that hasn't already been said? I mean, probably, of course, people all have their own voices, but you know, that's really hard to play your Chopin sonata or list sonata in that way. So, and it also stands a chance of being lost sort of in the enormous catalog of, of, 
pre-existing recordings. Exactly. So I don't know. It's been really rewarding to try to explore and get to know these, you know, works that are overlooked. Well, and you, of course, you play them so beautifully. Uh, congratulations on the glowing reviews of the second Scarlatti CD. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, really. Now, tell me, how did you think about starting Music by the Glass, which has become such a runaway hit? I mean, everywhere you do it, it's always a sellout show. Um, Music by the Glass. How we, you know, actually, we were thinking, I think it was with one of the board members of Young Concert Artists, actually, because my husband, Ron, I don't have to say my husband, you know, Ron, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> it was on the roster of YCA. So we would often have these dinners with board members. And I think it was in DC, we were sitting down with one of the board members and we were ordering wine. We thought, oh, we don't want the whole bottle. We would just like this, this glass of this Pinot. And um, we thought, wait a minute, why don't we go back and do something like that with music? Why not music, but you don't have to have the entire symphony or sonata like it used to be, you know, um, sort of hearkening back to the golden age where you have just a potpourri of different things. And so that's where we got it. And we thought, you know, even you know, we're not the first ones that combine wine and music. Many, many, many uh, concert presenters do that. So that's not something new. I think what's new about Music by the Glass is, um, well, the setting's not new either because people play in art galleries, but I think it's the combination of art gallery, wine that's paired and introduced, um, and the music that, you know, can be taken from all kinds of different uh, works and the mingling. I think that the social aspect is mm -hmm. what makes ours unique. And it's not to say that other series don't have receptions, of course they do. But I think our goal has been from the beginning to bring young professionals. That's not to exclude people who don't fit under young or professional or young, <laughs> you know? Right, right, of course. But I, I you know, I look at the supporters for classical music, especially since New York was my home base for so long and we're surrounded by these amazing patrons for the arts, you know, and I think, okay, um, are there children or their grandchildren who will continue to do what they're doing? Because that is such a big part since the government here is not um, fully supportive of the arts. It's the private, passions and love of these people that keep this going. You know, it's a synergy between the artists yeah. and the people who love this um, and people who have the means to support it. So we wanted to create something where we can, um, I don't want to say educate because that's absolutely the wrong word, but we want them to get to know the music, get excited by it, so that people our age, we can grow together, grow old together, and sustain sustain the support for music. That's what we really wanted, and and to have a social outlet. And you, yeah. you and I know now, after being quarantined for two months now, how meaningful it is to be. I mean, these virtual things are amazing, but it's so different to be able to sit there and breathe together with the music and be up close, you know, of and course. to talk and to hug, you know, all of, of those things that make us connect. So. That make us feel more human. But you're right that, that, that it's, it's mingling centricity of it that, that is so, that draws always so many people because, you know, some of my friends our age uh, love going because they take dates. Uh, yeah, it's a wonderful way of going on a date to go to. Oh yeah, party. and we've had um, three weddings, I think, come out. Of right. <laughs> so you know, it's just just that alone, you know, because this is not just purely concert, nor is it really a party. It's kind of equal part all, and it's very. It feels, you know, very sort of cool because the wine is worth mentioning that it is a premium wine. It's not just you know whatever burns yeah, they yeah, drink. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't come out of a jug. It 
and uh, you always have a sommelier who chooses the wines according to the program. So it all just kind of interconnects in a wonderful way that brings people uh, satisfaction through arts, but also just, you know, the wine and food, because food's always great, wine's always wonderful, and everyone's happy and satiated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. how many of these a year do you do? <laughs> I'm sorry? How many a year do, do you usually do? Well, we started out with four. Um, and now we try to do two or three a year just because of just the logistics of putting everything together in New York. But, you know, it's really important to us. It's our baby. And mm -hmm. it's also important to us in many ways because it keeps our family, our musical family in New York together. You know, mm -hmm. and it's our opportunity to collaborate with our friends in a way that's just just fun you know there there's just yeah. no stress involved I, I think it's i think it's a really special event absolutely no i can testify to that yeah. having had yeah. the pleasure of being part of a few many times uh, now now I'll, these are very easy but sort of one of my favorite parts the short question answer things do you believe in practicing hands separately I better be careful because I give my students all kinds of advice. Yes, I do. Actually, you had Antonio recently. Mm -hmm. Yes. And when I was at Piano Fest years and years and years ago, Antonio is the one that told me to practice just the left hand. And I think I was learning the Brahms Second Sonata. Yeah, I think that's the piece that he gave me that advice about. So I, I do do that, especially the, I don't practice the right hand so much. Um, separately. But I think the left hand often gets neglected. Um, and, you know, we end up relying on the right hand a lot, if, especially for yeah. right hand anyways. And I think sometimes if you take that away, it's kind of like your, your training wheels are gone. And mm -hmm. so you try to do everything with your left hand. And I think that's good, good exercise and good practice. Yeah. I mean, there's no right or wrong. You know, everyone has a, every, every, everyone that I talk to is such an accomplished pianist that, you know, whatever they do clearly works. Uh, I, I find that I like practicing, not a lot, but hence separately, especially when I'm learning new music for myself, because I think it actually helps me kind of input the data into my brain. Yeah. Like, you know, connect the finger muscle memory to the notes I'm hearing. Yeah. Uh, it's just easier if it's one hand at a time. Right. So I find it, it was just for me more efficient way of just storing stuff in my system in my body, so then I can play with both. Yeah, um, yeah. But but you know, there's there there. It's it's not a must, but well, it's an it's interesting. Kind of, well, it's kind of like do you practice in rhythms or not? Right, I, I do. That's kind yeah. of a <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's also a question of habit. Like if it works for you, great. But if it doesn't, then it's a waste of time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, then uh, do you use iPad? I do. Now I really do. I, it took me a while to transition because Ron was trying to get me to do it for so long. And then he finally got it for me for Christmas. And I thought, okay, this is expensive and I don't want to let it go to waste. But, you know, the iPad is great. It's just the pedal. It's tricky, mm -hmm. you know, to maneuver. But I, I, I'm, I'm sold. I'm sold on it. Yeah. Your favorite app to use? Oh, I only did four score. I didn't know there were other apps. No, there's an app that I will tell you now about. It's called Scribble Together. It's great for teaching. Um, there's like a small fee, I think, like five bucks or something a month. Um, what it does, and I'm not affiliated, so don't <laughs> don't think it, I'm not selling anything. But what I, it's gimmicky in a sense that you can upload the music, and then when you do remote teaching, um, if you um, mark something up on the score your student sees your mark in real time and then it vanishes like magic ink so you're like in circle things and draw errors and like if they make mistakes as they play they'll you see have, it appear you have them. to both have the same score though yeah you both have the same score and you link up your apps and then if they oh, if they're playing from the they see your marks in real time i see well, it's, look, it's a game, you know, but it's fun. You have to continue. Well, uh, I will. <laughs> yeah. I, I, once I got into all this, I can't stop. I love it. Uh, you know, but, but I also do handwriting. Uh, you know, like my composition scores are all handwritten. Oh, so, so beautifully done, though. I just, thank you. I just dropped my ear. Anyway, I'm, oh, there it is. 
Um, <laughs> man, this is hilarious. You need two, yeah. <laughs> I know. Well, yeah, it actually works miraculously with one, but it's better with two. Um, now, what is your favorite book? Oh my goodness. It depends. Um, you know, for a long time when I was in college, it was all the Jane Austen novels. But now, <laughs> this sounds really dorky, but right now I'm reading The History of Western Music by Taruskin. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I mean, I shouldn't say I'm reading because it, it's so monumental that, you yeah. know, it, by the time I'm done with five chapters, I have to go back and just try to read it again. Um, but it's fascinating and it's so mm -hmm. well written and so right now my favorite is that just because that's what I'm working on. Um, Jan Swafford has a beautiful biography of Brahms, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, I also have, I, I have not finished it, but the Schumann biography by John DeVario. Oh yeah, I have that, yeah. Really, really beautiful. And so I'm gonna- And since you mentioned um, Wagner List, Tristan, um, you should take a look at Tristan Chord. Ah. It's a volume this thick, and oh, it's a oh, humongous analysis, both musically and psychologically, of Tristan. You know, I'm to my utter uh, embarrassment, don't remember, but it's a wonderful scholar. I mean, I have the book, I read it. Okay. okay. But it's well worth reading. It's just giant, also. It's like 800 pages. All right. Um, that might have to be great. somewhere, but yes, okay. <laughs> yeah. But I have, I note to self, remember the authors. Yeah, that's, that's unforgettable. Of them. But because I love the book. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's in a blood red cover. It's so cool. Um, okay. It's called Tristan Chord. I will. And uh, what would you say to a parent or a student? Um, just about yeah well about their music studies like what would be the one most important thing you would say to a parent of someone who's going into a serious study of music um to not push them to just let them find their own way because i think it's the only way for anybody to really find their own voice in the end and i think the music world is just inundated with so many pianists, right? And, it, and it's not that they, they all work so hard, but I think the earlier and the sooner that we feel free not to be in a box in any way, mm -hmm. I think the better. So that's beautiful. Not that's to push, fair. yeah. <laughs> what, would, what would you say to a music teacher? Kind of the same thing, instill a love, because I think it has to stem from there. And it, it, well, actually, it's such, I feel this as a teacher too, because um, there is such a psychological element to any kind of teaching. But I think in piano, even more so because your, your words can have such an effect that I probably, I'm not even aware of, they can have a lesson and they can go back and think about it. And that can actually tr change for worse or better their, attitude towards music. And so I think that as teachers, we have to be really careful. We have to know the student because method A will not work for the next student, you know? So um, I, I don't know, I think it's a really delicate balance of being encouraging, but also being very disciplined in, you know, this is, right. you're doing too much or you're doing too little. You know, I, I told my students recently in a class because you know i think inspiration for me personally as a musician comes from just everyday things and my mom was having um, some issues with her heart and blood pressure and it was a really difficult time for a while she's okay now but you know being very careful but i remember when we were taking her to see all these specialists and i was taking all these ranges, okay, this is the normal range, and then this goes into hypertension, and this, this is good. You, you know, there are all these ranges of numbers, right? And they're all color coded. Right. And I thought, okay, so that is the same thing. When in music, you can, you can be free, but I think there is a range. You know, you can't just be you and not serve the music. Do you know what I mean? That's and brilliant. I think it's really important to stay in the, 
normal or the stylistic or the respect for the composer range. And so I try, you know, I guess I'm saying this because there does need to be certain disciplines. You know, there's sometimes you'll teach a really talented student who kind of just goes and does their own thing. Yeah. Now, is that my job as a teacher to say brilliant? No, not really, because I do think that classical music, just like any other arts, ballet or, you know, visual art, the fundamentals is important and that has to be there and that can't be neglected, you know? Of course, I couldn't agree more. You know, in Russia, we have an extension of, a, of international saying uh, that goes like, oh, make yourself at home, but don't forget your guests. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I am only aware, and if anyone knows that in another country they do that too, please uh, comment below. But um, I only am aware that in Russian, we are, it's a two-part saying. The, oh, same, the first part is everywhere all over the world, make yourself at home. But in Russia, people say, but don't forget your guests. Like, oh, don't make a mess. So funny. Oh, wow. Abide by the rules, you know what I mean? Yeah. So feel free, but within reason. Yes. And it's right. Um, the range is a great idea. I think you, should, you ought to make like a rainbow fla flag with like a color-coded <laughs> ranges for things. Because yeah. it, it's, it's great. I'm a very visual aid person. Like, I love making these kinds of things. Oh, no, I do too. I mean, I, I think it's, you know, like it, when you're a teacher, I think whatever makes the student understand it, it, your concepts the most concretely and just as quickly as possible is best. Yeah. So yeah. If, if I say, I mean, this is the other thing I think music teachers, and I include myself in them, obviously, um, yeah. all of us should try to nurture is, and I didn't do this when I was a student. So um, is I, I also tell my students this, it's like, you having a GPS. It's like sometimes people get in the car and they're just aimlessly driving. And that's what happens in music when you're just kind of playing the notes and you're not aware of where the cadences are or where the unusual harmonies are or when you are leaving your tonal center, you know, because all of these things have to contribute and, and you know, inform where you're going and the decisions that you make musically for it to be organic, right? And so I always say, you have to have a little bit of a GPS in you too. Okay, turn right here and tell yourself why. And it doesn't mean that you can't, you know, be free within it once again. Right. But I think there has to be an understanding of where there are pillars within. Of course, because we're within a pre-existing structure of music which is com coming from a composer, whatever mm -hmm. we think of it. And if we don't make a right, we're gonna hit the wall. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, absolutely, perfect, that's so good. What would you say to a student? In general? Just, just the one thing that you feel is the, encapsulates the most important message. For being a musician? Yep. Mm. Sorry, that's really hard. One thing. No, but that's good. I love watching people think and, and, and that's the most valuable answer when it's thought about. Um, I think guarding yourself. I, I, I think I have to explain what I mean by that. Um, and I think that's true today more than ever because there is a sense, because everything is virtual and people have access to everything. I think people are more exposed than ever, right? And as we talked about, it's both positive and negative. I want, I would like all my students to feel protected by their own sense of worth, you know? And that what I say or what some judge says or that it doesn't penetrate in a way that affects their own sense of worth. You know what I mean? And, and in a sense, to separate themselves from, and this again might be contrary to musicians who, you know, I'm one with the music. You know, I've never really felt that um, in, in that way. I love music deeply, but there's music and then there's me. 
you yeah. know, and I'm, I'm a separate person and I'm a separate entity and I don't want my ability or what I do in music to define who I am or how I feel about myself. And I think that's very hard to do sometimes in our profession yeah. and everything. And so I would love for my students and all the students really to find a way to cultivate, you know, this protective element in them so that yeah. it doesn't penetrate their own sense of worth, whatever happens in this business. That and that is so important. That is such an important advice because that is, uh, one can talk for hours just about that because, you know, we musicians tend to be extra sensitive because we work with expression of emotions, but it's, <laughs> it's a floodgate that opens both ways, right? So you, you, you let your emotions out, but you let everything else in. That's right. And this can be um, a not always uh, constructive. Yeah. If not to say it could be constructive. So that's, that's very good, very good advice. And finally, in conclusion, what would you say to yourself at 20? Oh, learn more music. <laughs> no, really. You know, <sighs> Mr. Lowenthal, there was a, it, my freshman year, you know, he would say, well, what are you going to bring next week? As if I had to bring something new every week. And I mm -hmm. took it literally. I was stressed mm -hmm. and I learned so many things that year. And then I realized my sophomore year, I was like, well, he doesn't really mean it. <laughs> I asked some of my studio mates and they were like, oh no, I've been playing this few, few lessons. And I thought, yeah. oh, okay, I'm going to slow down. And, and so I, I, but you know, I wish I had kept that up even more because I think what you learn when you're younger sticks with you, A. And even if it doesn't stick with you, you learn the language of that composer and mm -hmm. you're much more confident and you can, you can approach things more quickly you know you can totally. test it more quickly yeah totally. and and you know maybe take competitions less seriously no you, both, both are beautiful and wonderful and, and I, I think many of us think uh, those two things very frequently when we look back at ourselves practice correctly mm -hmm. yeah don't you wish we had practiced maybe even half the time, but more efficiently. More efficiently yeah. Efficiently, more efficiently. That's yeah. Right. Practice with purpose. I always, That's you right. know, say, don't just sit there, do it like <laughs> mean it or don't do it. You know, it's better take a walk, get inspired. You're right. Uh, a la Schumann, just take a walk. Brahms. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Well, look, it's been so wonderful to have you. Thank you so much for, for giving me, uh, your beautiful company, your time, and your ideas. Mm -hmm. And I know they will be so beloved and welcomed by everyone. Thank you, Constantine. I miss you and I hope we can see each other soon. Yes, we yeah. shall. Absolutely. Yeah.